I'm Justin Moss for Florida Grand Opera. Within two years of the premiere of Richard Strauss's opera Zalome, the opera had been seen in 50 different opera houses. 1905 was a time of interest in decadence, a time of musical experimentation, and Richard Strauss had become famous through his tonal poems, also Sprach Zarathustra, Don Juan, and Heldenleben, but he had pretty much exhausted his symphonic ideas at this point. The play on which his opera Zalome is based was written by Oscar Wilde. It was a failure in Paris. Performances had been prohibited in England, but there was a German translation that became very popular, and Max Reinhardt did a phenomenal staging of the play in Germany, which Richard Strauss saw in 1903. He was pretty exhausted symphonically, idea-wise, and thought, this is exactly what I need, a challenge to build a big musical tonal poem based on a text. He set about working very quickly, and the opera was ready in 1905. This was something new. Performances were being discussed that, like Strauss had done something, a real step ahead of everything else he had done. He also, you know, was known as one of the important living composers at the time, so there was great interest in exactly where he was going with this. He'd written two operas that had only been modestly successful prior to Zalome, and uh, everyone in Europe pretty much assembled for that world premiere. It created a sensation, and in spite of the grittiness of the text and the story, the music was overpowering. People were in credulous at how he had created this series of light motifs, melodies that represented ideas, people, action, and so forth, presented them almost in fragments at the beginning of the work, but spends 100 minutes over the course of just one act with no intermission, welding them together to create one of the most monumental musical resolutions anyone had ever experienced in the opera house. It was an amazing accomplishment and indeed something completely new. People had never seen the likes of it before and one could argue we've not seen the likes of it up until the present time. This was a wild achievement and unfortunately much of the opera going world didn't appreciate the mixture of biblical story, stark eroticism, uh, murder and possibly necrophilia quite as much as Oscar Wilde did. And the Metropolitan Opera gave its first production of Zalome in 1907. It didn't work very well. It was a Sunday matinee. Everyone was fresh from church, if you will, and were basically crawling on their hands and knees up the aisle to get out of the theater at the end of those really excruciating 100 minutes. A movement was launched by major donors of the Metropolitan Opera to bring the curtain down forever on the piece, and thus that was the only one single performance of Zalame given at the Metropolitan Opera until 1934, a long stretch of absence. In the meantime, though, it had developed an international reputation as one of the great dramatic and vocal challenges for big dramatic sopranos and many of them really literally fought for the role. Now, there's a problem in the piece, though, in that Zalame has the famous Dance of the Seven Veils, and most of the singers who perform big, dramatic, operatic music haven't spent a lot of time in the dance studio. It's a different discipline, and uh, many of them are not comfortable doing a 10-minute dance, and uh, often we were treated to stand-ins, a dancer, a corps de ballet member, who came and performed the dance while the soprano more comfortably disappeared from the stage for those few fleeting minutes. It's a great piece, though. Zalome comes out of Herod's banquet at the very beginning of the opera. There's no overture, there's no prelude, and the uh, opera sweeps right into her miserable frustration. The captain of the guard is saying to a page, look at how beautiful the Princess Salome is tonight, and the page realizes that Naraboth is in trouble if he's infatuated with this girl because she's obviously dangerous. The whole family is, wickedly so. 
We hear from the cistern, a big well, if you will, with a grate over it, the voice of John the Baptist. He's been arrested by Herod, imprisoned in the cistern, and he calls out denunciations of Salome's mother, Herod's wife, Herodias, who'd previously been married to Herod's brother. He curses her as being an evil lady of Babylon, etc., uh, much to Herodias's consternation, but it sets the tone musically and dramatically for one of those important fragments that will come together. Salome draws close to John the Baptist and identifies three attributes that she very frankly admires. First, his white body. Second, his black hair. And third, his red mouth. She, procla she proclaims each of these beautiful beyond belief, horrifying the Baptist. And finally, at the third attribute, he's had enough. And on his own volition, he willfully retreats back into the cistern rather than remain in the presence of this horrifying woman. Salome is, of course, disappointed, but Herod comes out now, having noticed her absence, and he tries to persuade her to dine with him, to drink with him, and then to sit with him. She'll have none of it. And finally, he proposes that she dance for him. She refuses him twice, but on the third time, as he becomes even more desperate in his entreaty, he offers her anything she wants in return, up to half of his kingdom. She gives it a little bit more thought, and looking at her mother for encouragement probably gets a nod. Her mother had been disturbed by Herod's attention to Zalame and thought Zalame had done well to refuse to dance for him. But now that the reward seems to be potentially so high, she's thought better of it. Salome agrees that she will dance, and the famous dance of the seven veils is performed. At its conclusion, Salome stands before Herod, and he is overcome with desire and lust and his willingness to give her whatever she wants. She has consulted with her mother, though, and demands the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. Herod is horrified. He can't risk executing this man. After all, he may be a holy man. He offers her many things in lieu of the head of John the Baptist, but she'll have none of it. Growing increasingly petulant, she demands, no, I will have the head of John the Baptist, nothing else. Until finally, Herod is completely defeated. He collapses. Herodias withdraws the ring from his finger, which is presented to the executioner who descends into the cistern to harvest to the head. The music becomes increasingly tense as Alame waits over the cistern. She's concerned that she's not hearing desperate cries. She thinks the executioner may have lost his resolve. But finally, as the tension in the music grows, finally, a great roar from the orchestra is heard. A crescendo begins to build, and an enormous arm is thrust up from the cistern, bearing a silver charger with the head of John the Baptist. Salome seizes this to the consternation and horror of all of the guests who are watching and proceeds her great final monologue in which she addresses herself to the head and says, you wouldn't even look at me, much less would you allow me to kiss your mouth, which I admired so, but now your head belongs to me and I can do with it what I want. And we have the orchestra finally stitch every one of those leitmotifs, those themes, those melodies for John the Baptist, for Zalame, for Herodias, for Lust, stitches them together to build one huge climactic resolution that is absolutely one of the most stunning accomplishments in orchestral writing ever created. It's absolutely stark. We have a great resolution from the orchestra, and then Herod, finally overcome with what he's brought to bear, cries out, Man tota desis vi, man, kill this woman! And the soldiers rush at her with their shields and crashingly crush her to death and finish the opera. It's easy to understand why people have reacted so violently against the piece, but I think as Strauss composed this, 
he was absolutely unconcerned with the morality of the story of Oscar Wilde's play even. I believe the experience he had in confronting the play was this is a story of profound wickedness and depth that I can tell musically just as Oscar Wilde had written it in such complete style and texture that much of my work is done for me. The ideas, the light motifs are laid out dramatically. I just have to write the music and this I think I can do. And indeed he did. The Florida Grand Opera's production of Zalame is not to be missed and if you have never seen this opera, by all means don't miss this opportunity. Not for the faint of heart though, if you're unwilling to submit yourself to completely being overwhelmed with the greatness of the drama, the music, the horribleness of the story, you better stay home because it is sure to happen and provide you with an experience you will not soon forget. I'm Justin Moss and I look forward to seeing you at the opera.